My father came from a very humble home in a very special place in Franklin County, Tennessee. It was a home that was warm and open. His mother trusted him to be wise and discerning. By the time he was six, his mother basically said, Johnny, when you've done your chores, just be home for supper by six. If she happened to notice that Dad was interested in butterflies, she went out and got two books about butterflies and just left them for him to discover and then let him take off with it. My father was very much influenced by his mother's religious perspectives. She was a pillar for the Cumberland Presbyterian Church. She was also an independent explorer. His father, Harvey Templeton, became a lawyer. In a small town, you couldn't just thrive on one profession like the law. So he became something of an entrepreneur in building houses for rent, acquiring farm properties and managing them. My father lived in a area with forests and riversides. He and his brother and friends would go and get food for the table. So what food might they be getting? Frogs. One time, however, they forgot to bring the buckets to store the frogs that they captured, so they were very innovative. They had some rope, and they tied the lower legs down by their ankles closed, and then as they caught every frog, they would put the frog down inside their pants until their pants were completely full and they could stagger to the shore. He was talking with a man in another county one day when he was about 14, and the man said, uh, you are gonna go to college? Well, there's only one college to go to, and that's Yale College. He learned that he had to have what was called advanced mathematics. When he talked to the principal, the principal said he was sorry there was no one to teach the course. But if you can get five other students who will take such a course, and if you teach that course, and if you and all the five students pass that course, I will certify it. He had the five students all lined up, he stayed about two weeks ahead of all the other students, and come the end of May the next year, they all took the exam, passed it, and the principal certified the course. When he went to Yale, he was one of the very few boys from a public high school. This was now into the Depression. This was 1930. His sophomore year, his father wrote him and said, I cannot give you one more nickel for your education. He took three part-time jobs, so he shaped his disciplined approach, how to get his studies and not let anything intrude. He later said that that adversity taught him that you're going to always learn much more by setbacks than you're going to learn from what goes well. He thought that one of the great opportunities right there in the middle of the Depression would be to make his career about the science of value investing. So by the time he was ready to go to Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar, he went to Oxford wanting to pursue this. He met his tutor, and the tutor said, well, young Templeton, what do you want to read? And Dad said, well, sir, I think I would like to read business management or economics, at which point the professor leaned forward, uh, having not moved before that moment, and said, a gentleman would never read such subjects. After he graduated from Oxford, my father decided he would go home, not across the Atlantic, but all the way across Europe, all the way across the Middle East, Asia, and various areas, and then come across the Pacific. I think that very decision opened the door in his mind to even conceive of being an innovator as a global investor. He discovered how much great culture there is, how many different religious perspectives, how many different value structures were out there, and he realized how limited one's horizons were living in the West and being influenced just by the way that the West looked at things. He then went back to America, married my mother. They went to Texas. He joined an oil prospecting business as treasurer to understand how business operates from the inside. Having been successful in that for two years, he and my mother then went to New York City and they made uh, plans that they would save 50 cents of every dollar that they earned. And they made a game out of it. And again, this is in the middle of the Depression. He recognized that there were perhaps over 100 companies that were in various stages of bankruptcy. He borrowed about $10,000 to buy 100 shares or so of each of these companies. And at the end of four years, 
Only three of them actually stayed permanently in bankruptcy, and the others returned a very handsome profit. And of course, that became his investment model, to be a bargain seeker, not to get influenced by the herd. Indeed, the history of the Templeton Growth Fund began for its first three years, starting in 1954, losing money. But people stuck with him, and by the time he got into the fourth and the fifth year, it really began to accelerate. His own principles were never make assumptions without testing them. Never take things for granted. Never go into debt. As he gained success and recognition, he passionately felt that if the blessings in life which he felt so strongly were real, how could he begin to be an enduring blessing to others? He made an important statement at that time. I have spent almost my whole life trying to help people to become materially prosperous. Now I feel liberated to devote the rest of my life to the much more meaningful concept of how to help them to become spiritually prosperous. God gave us our minds to be proactive, to not just be comfortable, to not be passive. This led to his first major philanthropic effort, the Templeton Prize for Progress in Religion. 